Welcome to our online worship service. We are glad you are here. Because confession is good for the soul, I have to admit I am getting weary in this pandemic. Over two months of social distancing, wearing a mask and gloves, not seeing our family and friends, being limited in where we can go and what we can do is taking its toll. At the same time, it doesn't do anyone any good to complain about our present situation. If you're able to venture outside, you've probably come across signs and messages giving thanks for our frontline workers and encouraging the general public that we are in this together. But I have not come across any words of encouragement to cry out to God for help. I suppose that's just a sign of our times. Friends, I am glad you are here to join us in prayer, to seek the Lord's help and to cry out for strength and encouragement during these difficult days. In a moment, you're going to see images of people in prayer. And some of those images have a military element to them. Please don't be offended by them, but rather look at the time that we are living in as a battle. The Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians, For we do not battle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And part of our armor is prayer. Paul continues, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all of the people of God. The opening sequence shows the people of God in prayer. So let's join them.
Well, welcome friends again, and I want to give a warm welcome to my colleagues, uh, David and Aaron today in our service. So again, uh, we're, we are glad you're here with us. So please uh, pray along in our prayers today. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from, from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And the collect for today. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we loving you in all things and above all things may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire through jesus christ our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god forever and ever amen my dear brothers and sisters the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness of His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear his holy word and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. You can say together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we not, ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but they, that they may be turned from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him the rest of our lives, may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And there you go, Aaron. But you are the ones chosen by God chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen by a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him. 
and tell others to the, of the night and day difference he made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then there'll be one over to God's side, and there will be to join in the celebration when he arrives. Make the master proud of you by being good citizens. Respect the authorities, whatever their level. They are God's emissaries for keeping order. It is God's will that by doing good, you might cure the ignorance of the fools who think you're a danger to society. Exercise your freedom by serving God, not by breaking the rules. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Love your spiritual family. Of your God, respect the environment, or respect the government. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay. So we continue on in our study in First Peter. Uh, last week in our study, we looked at the issue of the church, and we said that the church is built on Jesus as the chief cornerstone. We are part of the church, and we have a role in the church. And like I've asked many, many times over the years, am I, we, as a church, perfect? Well, well, of course not. We are saved by grace. We are forgiven. We've been given the Holy Spirit of God to help us change and to be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. At the same time, we can ask the question, do we live in a perfect world? A world which is governed by perfect people? And we have the same answer, of course not. But our passage today poses a bit of a problem in the form of verses 13 and 14. Make the master proud of you by being good citizens, respect the authority. Respect all human authority. Or another translation says, submit to all human authority. So you see the problem there. So we're going to need some wisdom. And so let's pray first, and then we'll dive into our passage. Well, Father, again, we thank you that you promise that when two or three are gathered together, Lord, even through the computers and, and uh, through the technology, Lord, you are present with us. So we need your wisdom, Lord, as we look into your word today. We ask you, Lord, to continue to teach us truth through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we pray in his name. Amen. So in verse 13, it says, Make the master proud of you by being a good citizen. Respect the authorities. Now remember when and who wrote this. It's the Apostle St. Peter. He is the one who witnessed the crucifixion of his friend Jesus on a cruel Roman cross. Peter himself would be persecuted and arrested by the same Roman government a government which would eventually put him to death as well. But he writes 
submit to all human authority. Now, I just want to break in at this point and say that you might be thinking like I am, hold it a minute, St. Peter. What do you mean, submit to all human authority? How can you say that? The emperor Caesar, who persecuted the early church, him, submit to him, who put thousands to death, men, women, and children, his authority? Then you fast forward to today. Submit to all government authority? What happens if I don't agree? What happens if they are wrong? So you see the problem here. This is a very difficult passage. We're going to need some wisdom. Now, I have a limited time, of course, to try un to unpack of all of this. But what I'd like to do is to lay down a framework which will help us look at the rest of the letter because there are more difficult passages to tackle on the way. Things like, you who are slaves must submit to your masters. In chapter three, we hear, you wives must submit to the authority of your husbands. That should be a fun one. All of you should be of one mind. And here's another good one. Christ suffered physical pain. You must arm yourselves with the same attitude and be ready to suffer too. Now, the problem with online sermons is that it is so easy to tune out at this point, switch to another online worship service, and no one would be the wiser. But I want to encourage you to hang in there. I want to say at this point, I believe this is very important if we're going to understand the true nature of the Church of Jesus. This is very important. Now, earlier in chapter 2, Peter told us that the church is not a building, but a people built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to suggest is that the true church is also one that relies on a different kind of wisdom and power. In other words, the church marches to a different drum in comparison to the world. For example, remember the story in Acts chapter 12 when Peter is arrested and put into prison. Quick reminder, King Herod Agrippa, part of the family line of other King Herods, not a nice bunch of people, puts Peter in prison guarded by 16 soldiers. The night before Peter is to be put on trial, he's under heavy guard, he's chained to the prison floor, soldiers inside the cell, and soldiers outside. In other words, Peter is in an impossible situation. There is no way he is getting out of there. So what does the church do? Protest outside? Write a bunch of letters to the government? Take matters into their own hands and organize a military extraction of Peter? No. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 says this. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Now, it doesn't make sense from a human perspective. It goes against a worldly point of view. Well, you know the rest of the story. An angel, no less, comes, releases Peter from his chains, and he just walks out of the prison while 16 armed Roman soldiers are none the wiser. What I am saying in all of this is that we as his church operate in a very different way than the world. Of course, there is a time when we have to get politically involved, write letters, etc., to our government. But what I'm saying is that in many, many cases, the church of 2020 does not look much different in its approach to life, especially in difficult situations than the world. The church 
can be very, very worldly. We don't want to be like that. And I believe it is our desire that we as a church are trying to put our hope first in God, in his power, in his wisdom. Or as our dear sister, Reverend Dorothy, used to always quote, but seek first the kingdom of God. This will help us understand the rest of the letter. Because what I'm getting at and what is coming up here is the whole subject of Christian submission. Jesus is the ultimate example of submission. He admitted himself to the will of the Father, even unto death on a cross. So think of it like this. It's another impossible situation. Sin, evil, is ruling the world. How will it be dealt with? Does Jesus take matter, matters into his own hands and fight fire with fire to change the powers and the authorities? No. He, sub he submits himself to God, and then God does the rest. He vindicates Jesus by raising him from the dead. And so God takes a seemingly impossible situation and he turns it right around. Now we can go back and talk about some practical implications in this passage. Peter reminds us that since Christians are in a very special way God's chosen people, their true home is with him. So as they journey through this world, friends, this world is not your home, Peter says. As temporary residents and foreigners, they must show by their conduct and their relationships that they are citizens of a better country. Significantly, the first three of the four sections which follow give examples of this kind of behavior. And they use exactly the same word, submission. In verse 13, verse 18, and then in chapter 3, verse 1, when it talks about marriage. The word submission has the literal meaning of stationing oneself beneath someone else, and so regarding the other person as superior to oneself. Now, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul show us that this does not mean that Christians are to be doormats. They may stand up for their legal rights. But what does it mean to live a life of submission? For many centuries, the people of Israel had to learn how to live out their faith in God while being ruled over by non-Jews. The Jews called them the pagans. And the pagans did not care at all about the Jewish faith. In fact, they were often mocked and treated badly because of their faith. Now along comes Peter, and he's trying to tell the church how to live under such conditions. So look at verse 12. Live an exemplary life. Such behavior silences the slanders which Christians were already having to face at that time. And you hear echoes here even of Jesus' teaching way back in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone can praise your heavenly Father. And here is where our word submission comes into the picture. Good conduct is to be expressed in a submissive acceptance of the demands of every authority instituted among men. And as I said, this is striking that Peter would even say this, probably writing in the age of Nero, and he still states that somehow, God has placed these people in authority over them. Christians, though, must give Caesar what is his due. Remember what Jesus said. 
give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Peter does not hint at any exceptions here, even though he knew how to refuse the authorities when they claimed for themselves what was God's authority. And so the idea in this passage is to obey or follow the rules of human authorities except when commanded to sin or violate God's commands. Peter gives four brief commands to sum up these practical requirements, and I'll end with the most difficult one. One, treat everyone you meet with dignity. That's verse 17, respect everyone. Peter says that our conduct has to be honorable, though these people, Peter calls them pagans, though they don't know it, there is coming a day in the future when the Lord will come back in person, in the person of his son, Jesus. And at that moment of his arrival, the pagans who've watched you, the church, ought to be saying, wow, those Christians, St. Hilda's church, you as an individual be believer had it right all along. Two, love your spiritual family. Verse 17, love the family of believers. When the church truly cares for each other, it is a very powerful witness to the world around us. Three, revere God. In other words, respect, honor God in worship. That's what we're doing right now. And four, here's a more difficult one, respect the government or submit to all human authority. Now this one poses a bit of a problem because we have witnessed in the last 100 years and beyond horrible tyrannies in Europe during World War II, the killing fields of Cambodia, and other corrupt and evil authorities have made their people suffer incredibly terrible things. Obviously, that is not what God wants. In fact, throughout the Bible, it has a lot to say against such corrupt leadership. But although tyrants and leadership can behave terribly, not least towards God's faithful people, it is still part of God's will that the earth should be ruled and governed by human authorities. Think of it like this. Order is better than chaos, even though we know well that order can turn into tyranny. Peter has a very different way of fighting this kind of tyranny. He says, be submissive to human authorities. I told you this was difficult. Make sure, he says, that your good behavior, behavior actually shames those who out of their ignorance want to criticize you. Remember those impossible situations that I mentioned earlier, that God can turn things around. Oppressive leadership and violent revolution are not the only options when we come against corrupt leadership, but rather serving the Lord trying to live a very different kind of life, a peaceful life, in the end is far more radical than simply taking matters into our own hands, fighting fire with fire, overthrowing one corrupt regime, and replacing it often by just another one. And history has proved that over and over again. And like I said, this is not easy stuff. Far from it. Jesus even promised this would happen when he said to Peter and his friends, you will be persecuted. Is that unfair? Is that unjust? Absolutely. But we are to handle difficult, sometimes impossible situations in a radically different way. And that is exactly what the early church did. And as many of you know, history tells us that the government of Rome 
did eventually adopt Christianity in the year 313 AD. Now that's a long time for the early church to suffer. But the church prayed and prayed and witnessed and prayed and prayed some more. And that's what we're going to do right now. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you call us to a very different way. Father, this is difficult stuff. And we pray, Lord, that you would show us your heart, that you would reveal the Lord Jesus to us in his attitude, that he would suffer death because he knew that was the will of his Father in total submission to his Father in heaven. We, we pray for the empowering of the Holy Spirit, that we as your church would truly know a different way of living, that we would rely on your wisdom and we would rely on your power, that we would indeed seek first the kingdom of God. And so we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. grateful that the Lord hears our prayers. We are so grateful that he knows our hearts and our minds. And so in a spirit of Christian unity, we come before the throne of grace today, and we ask the Lord to hear our prayers. We pray for God's grace. Lord, receive our prayers and hear our prayer. Lord God, through your grace, we are your people. Through your Son, you have redeemed us. You have saved us. In your Spirit, we have made, you have made us your own. And so today we pray for the church. We pray for uh, Bishop Charlie. We pray for Archbishop Foley Beach. We pray for the Anglican Network in Canada, part of the Anglican Church of North America. We pray for all leaders in the church. We pray for Pastor Greg and Jen today. We pray for Jay and myself. And we pray for all those who are involved in Christian ministry within our church, for your blessing and your empowering. Make our hearts respond to your love. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. And we pray for the world. Lord, at this time, we just continue to pray for this worldwide pandemic. 
We ask for your mercy, Lord, and we, we do pray for the miraculous, that you would deliver us, Lord, from this uh, virus, that there would be a quick um, uh, solution to this, some kind of um, vaccine, healing, Lord. We pray especially for the very vulnerable people, especially the elderly, Lord, who have been ravaged by this uh, disease. We pray for a hedge of protection upon our dear family in our church, Lord, especially those who are in a senior's residence. We pray for Eva. We pray for Ethel. We pray for Pauline. We pray for Fred and others that we know. We bring them before the throne of grace today, asking your protection, Lord. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world. Lord, we pray for the ways that we can reach out, taking care of people in practical ways. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry of uh, Food for Life. We thank you for the gift of evangelism. We continue to pray for our Alpha program, that it would be a strong witness to the good news of the Lord Jesus. Lord, bless us during these difficult days. We pray, Lord, that you would use the technology even to share the gospel. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. And we pray for the sick and those that we know in need. We continue to pray for our dear friend Warren, for Sue, and other people, I would just encourage you in your heart to name those people, to bring them before the throne of grace, trusting that the, that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and who desires wholeness and healing in our lives. We just cry out to God for those particular people. Lord, we pray for ourselves. Make our wills eager to obey and our hands ready to heal. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. And we give you thanks, Lord, for the blessings of this life. We thank you, Lord, for your protection. We, pray, we thank you for each other. We thank you for our family and our friends, for our church. We thank you, Lord, for the health that is in our bodies for your provision, Lord. And we pray especially for those people who through this pandemic have found themselves out of work. We pray, Lord, that as the uh, businesses begin to open, that you would get people back to work. Lord, in the meantime, we ask for your help, your provision. Lord, we give you thanks for the saints of God. And as a church, we are so... Uh, thankful for the life of our dear sister, Dorothy. Lord, thank you for her many, many years of service and her love for you and her wonderful example of a life given in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the way she has touched many, many lives in our church, and we bless her in the name of the Lord. Make our voices one with all your people in heaven and on earth. And let's pray together the words of the, the Lord's Prayer, praying with confidence, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We join together in prayer, the prayer of the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, 
We, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. <clears throat>
Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And I want to thank Aaron and my colleague David in joining me uh, today in worship. And thank you also uh, in joining us in our worship. And so we ask the Lord to bless you and to give you an incredibly good week. So bless you.